My name is Jess Servion, and I'm super excited to bring you my new podcast, The Juice with Jess. This podcast is going to be about everything in your customer's journey. We're talking acquisition, awareness, making that purchase, retaining that customer, bringing them back around, and everything in between. This is going to be all about delivering dope brand experiences and talking to some really amazing people who are in the customer experience space, the marketing space, and everything in between. Welcome back to another episode of The Juice with me, Jess. This week, I'm super stoked to bring you this episode because guess what, my friends? We are filming and recording in a penthouse suite in the Four Seasons at in Las Vegas at Shop Talk. Um, so kind of crazy. You might hear some people in the background because we also have an audience. So real fun. But um, also this week, I, I am joined by Nicole Ramirez. Nicole is one of my dearest friends. We met in a CX Discord, and she is now the e-commerce manager for UCLA, as in the school, which is so cool. And we have a lot to unpack there. Nicole, do you want to tell the audience who you are? Sure. So, uh, yeah, Nicole Ramirez. I've been in the D2C and e-commerce space for about 15 years. So kind of a generalist, done a little bit of everything. So I've been in marketing. I've been doing uh, warehouse management and also e-commerce. So uh, that's uh, kind of what my role covers now at UCLA. I work for one of the largest independent college bookstores in the country at the number one uh, public school in the country. So it's quite quite a cool place to be. And so uh, I manage the UCLA store website and also the Bruin team shop, which is a partnership we do with the athletics teams at UCLA. So working with NIC and, and on all of that college athletics merch. So it's really fun, really cool. Yeah. I think that's really so interesting because it goes to show you that one, e-commerce, CX, UX, all of these things if you are selling something on the internet or you're selling something at like a brick and mortar store, you have a need for an experience, my friends. You have a need for marketing. Before we dive into it, I'd actually really, because a lot of the audience is, you know, there's there's marketers out there, but there's also a lot of like CXers out there. And I'd really love to hear from your words, what does an e-commerce manager do? Yeah, so uh, it's, it's one of those um, kind of, over-encompassing terms, they can do all sorts of things. What I do specifically as the e-commerce manager is I make sure that the website is running correctly. I work a lot with IT to make sure, you know, all the scripts that we're running work and all of the images look correct and the SKUs are up and that the descriptions are accurate and compelling. And so I work a lot with the buyers and a lot with IT to make sure that's really robust. But also I manage the fulfillment team. So everyone who's actually packing up the orders and sending them out and also um, the customer service team. So we have a whole customer service team as well Yeah, as part of the e-commerce department. Yeah. So, yeah. It's like all encompassing yeah. brand experience. As like part of the legit, e-commerce department. Legit, all encompassing. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, yeah. Oh, yeah, I would yeah. love to know, like, how yeah. did you get this job? <laughs> yeah. Like I said, I'm, I'm very much a generalist. I've worn a lot of hats in my different uh, career paths. And um, I actually got it on LinkedIn, <laughs> which is like, uh, you know, in, in our spaces, we tend to work a lot on referrals and someone recommends you for a job. And that's how I've gotten jobs for quite a while. But this one, it just ticked all the boxes because I had had experience setting up a warehouse and setting up, you know, um, picking strategies and things like that and running a warehouse team. I had also had experience in marketing and in uh, running an e-commerce website. And so they were having a hard time finding someone who had that very uh, well-rounded experience. And so I applied in March of last year and got hired in July. So it was definitely Academia is very different. <laughs> it moves so slow. Yeah, I actually so, yeah. want to dive a little bit into that. Yeah. But I do have one comment to make, and this is just for like anybody listening. Like, even though we're talking about Nicole being a general list in the CX world and like e-commerce world, 
and and specifically we're talking about UCLA. I think it really goes to show you though, CXers, right? People who work in experience are also marketers. We're also UX people. We're also fulfillment center people. Like we are generalists and we can run so many different types of roles as they touch customer touch points. And you're you're a prime example of this. And I'm like super proud of you. <laughs> well, thank you. I really appreciate it. Yeah, uh, as a CXer, like uh, the first role that I got where I was the customer experience manager, I got the role because I had a marketing background and because the company was looking to really um, fine tune and, and provide a, a white glove experience for their customers because they had a very specific product. Mm -hmm. Education behind it was a little bit tricky and it was also a really high ticket cost. And mm -hmm. so they had been using a BPO and were looking to have like really specialized customer service as part of their team. And so they hired me. I came in and ran my first CX team, um, developing the brand voice, uh, teaching the customers how the different uh, profiles of our customers and how to communicate with each one. We tended to have customers that were a little bit older, kind of boomer aged. And so, you know, picking up that phone was just, it meant so much to them. And mm -hmm. so just really paying attention to who your uh, customers mm -hmm. are and meeting them where they want to be met right. and just taking that extra step. And so that was something that I did there, helped develop that. And they uh, were amazing. And basically like once we got those specialists set up, they were just running on their own. And so I pivoted more towards mm -hmm. the e-commerce to bring that CX and that marketing bit into the e-commerce space. Girl, so, I yeah. love it. Because this is what literally what I pre yeah. preach like yeah, all yeah. the time, right? It's about like brand experience and like brand experience is like in every avenue of it, but also like knowing your audience. Because yeah. not every setup that you have is going to work for every single one of your audiences. Yeah, man, I really want to dive into that. What does retention look like? I mean, I know you briefly touched it, but what does retention look like in a nonprofit organization, right? Because we're so used to it being revenue, 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 right? Like I'd love for you to just double click into that. Yeah, so revenue is definitely still an important consideration for us. All of the money that we make, like I said, goes back into the university and it's going in through student government, student activities, the student union. So we are the core place where especially new students come to like build their college experience on campus and the money that we make uh, in store and online all goes back to fund those experiences. Also things like uh, scholarships and all sorts of really um, important activities that happen on campus. And so um, it's, I, I still am in that revenue generating mindset because yeah. I want to, to make money to go yeah. towards those things. Yeah. But it's, it's actually, it just feels really fulfilling to know that, uh, what I'm working towards, I can see it a really actionable thing on campus. Like we'll see therapy dogs come in and know that, you know, it's it's midterms and we have therapy dogs on campus and the money that we made wow. slinging t-shirts, you know, <laughs> is is creating these experiences for these students to help them through their college career. So, yeah. God, that's actually really amazing, yeah. right? Because I think we talk in e-commerce a lot about one, sustainability, giving back, like all of these things. Like I've worked with several brands that like, oh, I want to give back and I want to do all this stuff. And like, they're like, I don't know, uh, like Feastables was like, giving back and in, in planting trees, right? So, but I think what's really interesting is that because you're, you're a nonprofit and you, because you have all of these like programs for students that you're giving like funds back to, right? It's like, in a way, that's your revenue, right? Like that's, like that's your revenue and it's like, and, and to see the direct impact. Oh yeah, a hundred percent. One really cool program that we have on campus is that we are, uh, the largest uh, student employer in Westwood, which is where the university is located. So, uh, and we're also an on-campus employer. So we actually work around the students' uh, schedules with their school. School always comes first. We have very limited hours available to them to make sure that they're not just, you know, working, 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 that they have the time to focus on their schoolwork. But it's really great to work with these students. They're so smart. They're so talented and I get to build relationships with the folks that 
uh, what we're doing is actually helping. And so that really, really means a lot. I, I think it's just amazing. I think it's really awesome because it's like we all, again, like we want to do like sustainability and we want to give back and all these things. But it's like you have this like really dope e-commerce customer experience program. that You're actually like getting to see the impact. And I think that's really, that's really cool. Um, I definitely want to dive more into that, but I, I this question like kind of popped into my head while, while we were chatting. So we were talking about like the customer service team, right? What types of inquiries do they get? Because here's why I'm asking this. Yeah. Um, coming from festivals, right? Gen Z can be difficult, be your best worst enemy. Okay. So I'm curious, like what types of questions are your customer service team getting from students as well as parents? Yeah, so it uh, is surprisingly <laughs> parallel to traditional DDC because it's things like, where's my order? How do I return this? Things like that. Uh, but we also deal with uh, in-store pickups. So we're fulfilling items that are very non-traditional, like your cap and gown, things that have very sentimental uh, meaning behind, like they're very, very important. And so really providing that experience where uh, the customer places their order, we have everything ready for them, we're able to hand it over to them directly. It's just really cool to experience. And it's really great that it's student to student because uh, my students are mostly uh, sophomores and juniors. And so they get to be the ones that are handing off the cap and gown to the seniors, which I think is pretty cool. Yeah. So yeah. Man, that's awesome. So you seem like a really analytical person and like wanting to like, um, you know, really improve programs and like understand data. What type of data are you looking at when it comes to like the CX department? Yeah. So we uh, we brought on a platform when I was there. Uh, like I said, academia is is a different beast for sure. Yeah. <laughs> Things move at their own pace. So. Uh, I don't I don't want to freak you out too much. Uh, but when I got there, uh, there was 20 people using a shared Outlook box. Oh, God. <laughs> so. Oh, God. How many inquiries were they getting a day? Uh, probably 50 to 60. Yeah. And they were all but they were all working two, three, four hours a day. So and, and many people with their hands in it daily. And so the first thing I did, I was like, no, 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 this is not going to work. And so we brought in a platform that would, uh, you know, manage that, a CX platform. And so that's been really great because that data just didn't exist before I got there. So the cool thing about the platform that we use is that before you can even respond to an email, you have to categorize it. So it won't even let you hit send oh, until you put it in a category. And so we're able to do that really high level uh, you know, filtering and, and organizing mm -hmm. right at the beginning. And then we do, uh, you know, it has macros and tags and all of that sort of thing. But I've really found that that little step of just, you know, you have to think about what is actually going on in here and put it in a category. Yeah. The time that it takes to do that is maybe a little bit prohibitive, prohibitive but, you know, the fact that they had to do it and they had to think about it, that data is really clean. Yeah. I mean, I think that's like the biggest problem. Well, like when we're talking about like customer support agents, right? Like I don't care what level you're in when you're in it and you're click clacking away, right? It's really hard to remember. I have to do all these other things. And then like, and if you don't create that habit and you don't continue that habit, your data can be so messy. So I love that you've created an agent experience that makes it a lot, um, a lot quicker and um, cleaner, right? Like, cause I, I think that that's like super important. Um, I, I've been on like so many different platforms where it's like, if you don't tag it right, or if like, if it's not a requirement, yeah, yeah, yeah. then the agents will like just put other. So yeah, so I think that it's, um, I think it's really important to like have clean data, but to also instill a process that is easy for the agents. For sure. Uh, yeah. And we've been really happy with our platform. It's actually the first time that I've used something that has integrated AI, which has been really interesting to yeah. use uh, and really helpful for the students. I mean, uh, one thing that I've really learned about students is that um, that a lot of them, especially this generation, Gen Z, like this is the, this is legitimately their first job. They grew up in the pandemic. Yeah. They didn't have the experience like I did where I was 16 and slinging t-shirts like, yeah, like that wasn't a thing for them. 
And so this is their first job and uh, they're really high performing. They want to do really well. But that means sometimes they come off a little robotic. They come Mm. off a little bit too like uh, like they're talking from a manual because they just are so interested in doing the job correctly that they don't always make that step to Mm -hmm. be uh, more conversational and, and, and more friendly. And the AI has really given them that tool where I've told them, you know, our AI does this and gives these kinds of responses. Those are more than okay to use. We want you to feel like you're talking to your friend when you're yeah. doing it. And the fact that the AI is the one telling them, you know, this is how to respond has really t- trained them over time, you know, to take that on on their own and be more conversational and be more friendly. Because a lot of time it's it's students talking to students a lot of the time. And so yeah. we want it to feel like that. We want that to be the experience of a student or an alumni is reaching out about their order that they know that they're talking to a student and that the fact that they purchased from us means that they're supporting their school in a really actionable way. And so it's super important for me uh, running the CX team to make sure that, you know, they're, they're having that conversational back and forth and so seeming like they're just talking to a chat bot. Guess what, fam? The customer community is back. If you're not already familiar with the community, you can sign up to get your questions answered, discuss best practices, and connect with other professionals in the CX space. Check it out today at community.customer.com. See you there. I mean, I think that's really interesting. You brought up like a couple of things that I actually want to like touch into, but like One, before we even get into talking about about AI, how did you develop the brand voice? Like in general, like how did you train the agents and your team, not even just the agents, like everybody under you, like under the entire e-commerce department about the brand voice? Because if I was walking into it in my day one, I would be like, okay, these are students and these are parents and these are alumni, right? And that's like really great, but it's like, I wouldn't think about like what my voice would be. Like, how did you approach that? Yeah, so uh, one thing that I really lucked out is that uh, we are part of uh, Associated Students UCLA and it's an organization that's been around since the school started, since 1919. So there's a really long history behind it. And they have a really strong voice and they have, uh, you know, a mission statement and I can look up the ethics and I can look up everything that I want to know about the kind of messages that we want to convey. Mm -hmm. And so I really use that as a foundation. And so I make it a point, uh, you know, to uh, really make sure that the students, when they're communicating, are thanking the people who are purchasing from us because they could buy that shirt or that hat at Target, at Fanatics, at any of our big competitors. And I want them to know, you know, every time they purchase from us, it's helping the students on campus. And a lot of them once were students on campus and remember that experience and have really fond memories of what it was like to be at school. And uh, yeah, so we have some very loyal customers just for that particular reason, because they you know, maybe they worked at the store when they were a student and they remember what it's like. And so just reminding them, you know, that that is what they are helping to build when they make that purchase is like golden. Like I couldn't ask for more. It's really, really wonderful. And I just leverage it at any opportunity because I think it's our strongest selling point. And it really, you know, but brand voice is like so different. You know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, because yeah. it's like it's like you have these loyalists already because they have these shared memories. It's very sentimental, right? So it's like you want to appreciate that and you want to like display that. Um, I think that's really awesome. So let's actually dive into the AI piece then. I'd love to hear like, okay, so you've developed out this brand voice, you've done these things, but then like What's the next step of that? Like if you're putting that into AI, like how did you train the AI to be like very thoughtful and sentimental? Yeah. So we're really lucky uh, with the platform that we use. Uh, A lot of the AI training comes from a knowledge base that we build out directly. So with our policies and procedures, but also with things like our brand voice. And so we're able to uh, really train that AI in how to respond. And it does things like you can actually, it gives recommendations. A lot of them are really good, but you can uh, also just go in automatically and edit those and change what you need to. But it'll also 
have this, it has this feature that I really love that's just make it friendlier. So like I said, our students sometimes struggle with trying to be very professional and really come across, you know, more like a manual or a how to than than conversational. And so just the opportunity to just, you know, write out what you would want to write out and then select make it friendlier has been really, really helpful for them. Wow. wow. Okay, cool. I I love that. Like, do you ever experience the AI, though, having any sort of like we call them hallucinations. Oh, yeah, for sure. <laughs> How do you manage I always, that? I, I always uh, train uh, our students. Uh, and also I work in tandem with with our CX manager, who's really, really amazing. Uh, the AI is a tool. It's not a replacement. Right. And so, you know, it's going to suggest things. You have to actually read it. You have to look at it. I don't want them to just send the boilerplate AI out into the world it's a foundation. It's a starting point. You still have to build from there. And you also have to double check it and make sure that it's accurate and that it's not, you know, yeah. going off the rails. And so yeah. that's a big part of the training is that it's a tool. It's not a replacement. How do you train your agents to QA along the way too? Like, or do you have one? Cause I run into this a little bit, right? Like I will, um, there's like a couple of, of brands that I've you know, advise or consult with. And, um, and I've run into this before where the AI kind of just like has these hallucinations, but then like the agents didn't like tell me about it. So I'm like, well, how am I going to QA this? You right. Know? Right. Uh, that's actually something we haven't really done much of, but it's something that I'm definitely going to have to go in and, and try to figure out. Uh, we, um, we are working with a platform and they're, pretty great at, at keeping it up to date. And anytime we have questions, you know, they follow through, but yeah, I really haven't. I know. Yeah. It's something of like, Oh, <laughs> no, no, no. I, I think that's totally fine. Yeah. Like, I mean, like, listen, like this is a very honest conversation, yeah. oh, right? For like sure. yeah. we're not going to have all the answers, yeah. but and it's so new. It's, it's something. So, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And I think that that's the thing is that we have to think about with AI is that it's really dope. Like you can utilize it for these process, but you still have to keep, it with boundaries and you can't forget about that. You know, um, I recently was like teaching a workshop and, and that, and like people were like, Oh, well, how do you deal with like the hallucinations? The same question yeah, I asked yeah, you. And yeah. I'm like, listen, my dudes, <laughs> like you got to put some boundaries around this. Yeah, yeah, you yeah. also got to create a QA process. Like it's not the end all be all. It ain't replacing your job. It's just helping you with your job. Exactly. That's it. Um, what's a pain point that you'd love AI to solve for besides tickets though? I wanted to go to my meetings for me <laughs> and take notes. Girl, <laughs> Girl I it's know. It's one of those things that, you know, it's, it's the struggle of everyone who is, uh, moving upward in their career. The more time you spend in meetings and the less time you spend, you know, having time to actually do work. <laughs> I know. I hear you. Yeah, yeah. I hear you. Are there any other places that UCLA is leveraging AI? Yeah. So um, the campus, that all, I mean, they have a whole um, department in Anderson that is really leveraging AI in interesting ways. Uh, we're really lucky that we um, are on campus. So we haven't quite used it for AI yet, although that's something that definitely we should look into. But we have done things like... Uh, there's a course, there's a, a professor who teaches a course on Google Analytics. And so we gave them access to the stores, Google Analytics, and they did their whole semester just about the analytics from the store. And I was able to tell them, well, I'd like to know if A, B, and C happens, what is D, you know, that sort of thing. And so there were about six different cohorts and I was able to, you know, tell them what I wanted them to look into, into the site. And then their finals all came back to me. And so I had just, you know. Dude, <laughs> you got this army yeah, of people yeah. who are like QAing things. Yeah. Hell yeah. Make them start a QA process for your AI. Yes, Make exactly. it self-training. Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah. One of the really interesting things that we learned from that is we, uh, because we are a nonprofit, we don't do a lot of, um, fundraising or anything like that that's not related to UCLA directly, but athletics came to us uh, during um, the wildfires in Maui. Everyone was doing Maui Strong related things, and they really wanted to make a Maui Strong UCLA t-shirt. 
and they asked us to make it. And so I was able to have um, Anderson do a deep dive to see uh, how that affected our sales and, and how much it made it rise or lower. And if it was something, you know, that was directing traffic to our site that would have come through, you know, non-traditional channels. And so it was really cool to just be like, we've never done this before. Can you guys take the time and, and dig into it? Because it's something I don't have time to do. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and yeah, it was, it's really great. And they, you know, they really enjoy, you know, working with actual data. So yeah, yeah. yeah. I know. I love it. I'm a data nerd. So like for me, I'm like, I'm like, tell me more about these insights that you've you've gotten. Well, I actually do have one. uh, Another question about it is like besides the Maui Strong, like what's a what's some feedback that you've gotten from um, from like in your your overall CX department, not even just the customer service, like e-commerce, like everything um, that you've leveraged to. make the experience better for the students. Yeah. What's your favorite one? So uh, I I have to go into returns for us. Uh, Mm. We're not doing anything amazing. We're doing pretty basic things. But uh, one thing also dealing with academia is that the person who had the job before me uh, had worked there for 35 years. She had been there before there was a website. (laughs) No way. And so there were certain processes that you just kind of learn along the way. Um, they had an issue where the customers were the ones who were generating the return labels. And because we're on campus, the chances of that package would actually get to us because they were just like, you we're sending it to UCLA, UCLA, Westwood, off it goes. And so they had built a really uh, protective of the store return policy where the customer actually had to have a signature required on their returns, which is wild. (laughs) And so one of the first things I did was go in and try to make it more customer friendly. Now they contact us. We generate that label for them. So we know our address. We know we're going to provide them with something that's correct. We're able to keep the costs down for things like that. Mm -hmm. And we actually leverage it as a benefit saying, you know, we heard you, we listened to you, we sent out an email to everyone who had ever done a return. Mm -hmm. Because the thing that I was hearing when I first came in was, your return policy sucks. I'm never going to buy from you guys again. Yeah, And um, I agreed. (laughs) And so I made a point once we changed that policy to message everyone who had ever done a return on the site and said, you know, we listen to you. This is our policy now. It's really easy. It's wow. a free return. Email us and we'll send you the label. So, yeah. And that re- we heard immediately, you know, a response to that. Wow. And that email actually generated quite a lot. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. That's awesome. Listen to all the fam out there, like listening or viewing or whatever. I just want to point out Nicole has changed the customer experience of UCLA. And I encourage you all to go and purchase a t-shirt from her because she is developing a dope experience for UCLA. And I think that's really awesome. And I think it goes to show you like, you know, that person that had that job before you, they might've been there for 35 years, but they would have like really stuck in their ways, like doing their jams, like whatever. But like times change. You evolve and like technology changes and you have to constantly like keep evolving. And like, I think it's really important as you're looking at your, your overall customer experience. I don't mean just service. I don't mean just website. I mean like fulfillment, um, you know, any, your, your shopping cart, your, any of these things, right? You have to evolve with, with the times and it, and it's really important. Yeah. Yeah, um, okay, I just have some fun questions for yeah. you. Yeah, I'm ready for it. What's your worst customer experience moment that you've ever had? Oh, man. What is my very worst? Oh, boy. Um, I, and, and saying this is really painful as someone who's worked in CX and deals with fulfillment, but I've had a couple of experiences where a package has just gone MIA and then crickets from the brand. Like that's, to me, that's the very worst that you could do, especially like one of them was like a $200 order that just like disappeared. Uh, And to just like, uh, I heard back from them, oh, so sorry, crickets. And I was like, that's it, really? (laughs) So yeah. So of course I never bought from that company again. It's, it's, it's painful as a brand to uh, really, um, you know, have to make that step. But when you make that step, 
you just build those customer relationships. I am constantly trying to tell uh, people that I've worked with at many different brands, you know, think of it as a marketing expense. Yeah. Don't think of it as a CX expense. Don't think of it as an e-com expense. This is marketing. So you have to spend like it's marketing. Yeah, I know. And I think that's a common misconception that like we think people think of CX as just support yeah. or it's just the community building. Like I constantly have these conversations with people where I'm just like, it's not about like, okay, it needs to go into the marketing department, right? right? What I'm saying is that I think that customer experience is marketing. It's your brand experience. Stand behind it. It's closer to anything that you could possibly do. Even an Instagram ad is not going to be as compelling as having an actual conversation with a person who's at the brand. So yeah. you have to treat it like the gold that it is. It really you know, it's the closest that you're going to get to building a relationship with that customer. Absolutely. So, yeah, you got to leverage it as much and as you can. And there's so many different channels and there's so many different things that you have to do. It's just like, just focus on like building a dope brand experience, man. Um, okay. I'm excited about this one. You ready? Uh, yeah. What's a leadership principle that you stand by? I, I, I have an open door policy and it's not just like saying I have an open door policy. Like, if my door is closed, I have a whiteboard on my door that people can leave notes to let me know that I need to follow up with them. Like everyone who works under me and everyone that works with me knows that you need those two minutes. I'm going to set it aside for you. And yeah, it eats into my day, but we're able to accomplish so much. And just, you know, in the moment, stay, just sitting around and talking about whatever is going on and moving forward, then letting that fester. And so- 100% stand by having an open door policy with everything, with ideas, with friction, with anything. And it just helps everyone move forward. So yeah. that's, yeah. Absolutely, man. I love that. I love like being a good leader means like, you know, not even just like coming to your office, but like being available for your team. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. And like, and establishing that line of communication. Yeah. Yeah. And it was the same policy that I had when I worked completely remote. My team knew. I was a Slack message away from a video call. Anytime they needed some FaceTime with me, you know, as long as I wasn't already in a meeting, I was there for them. And if I was in a meeting, you know, tell me you want to schedule a meeting with me and we're on it. So, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, last one. What's your favorite thing about working at UCLA? I love being on campus. <laughs> I didn't think I would. It's a really long commute. Uh, I live on the other side of town. I live near downtown and I'm commuting commuting all the way over to the west side but there's a reason I love doing it it's just being on campus like it's there's always something going on there's always activities you know there's been um, a lot of political unrest and seeing that you know happen on campus and seeing people using their voices to really stand behind their beliefs like it's it's really wonderful and it's just a really cool environment and it's also a nice reminder of why I'm showing up to work every day because it's for those guys. So yeah. yeah, I really love it. You have a community yeah. that you get to like visibly see yeah. all the time, yeah. and I think that's really dope. Well, I appreciate you coming on, Nicole. Tell the audience where they can find you. Yeah, so I am on LinkedIn. It's Nicole Ramirez. Uh, yeah, that's probably the easiest way to find me or, you know, our Discord group, which is how we met. And I love it. And I love everyone there. So, yeah. Yeah. I will put uh, Nicole's LinkedIn in the show notes as well as an invite to the CX Discord that we met in. Um, and I appreciate you guys all for tuning in to another week of The Juice. And I'll see you and you can hear me if you're listening uh, next Thursday. Toodles. Hey, wow. You made it to the end of the episode. That means that you like me and I like you, which also means you should subscribe to this show. <laughs>